case you're wondering, if you want it for a service, I'm the fill-in guy for the fill-in guy for the regular guy. Pastor Casey was out of the weather late this week, and uh, I, uh, rather than swapping off things, you know, in the search, I said, well, I'll take today and I'll take next Sunday. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. He, he said he wasn't coming today, just to be safe. All right. This is the seat we're going to cover today. Now, as we start through, everybody's wondering, well, you know, this guy is at the beginning of the year. Well, we're kind of catching up with ourselves. Lucy of Syracuse, her saint day was the 13th of December. Katarina of Bambura was the 20th of December. And now this gentleman is the early part of January. So if you look back where Pastor Vinny started, right after Thanksgiving, he would have been doing these three right then. But he decided to wait for Christmas and New Year's. So I'm catching up where he takes over two weeks from now. Uh, and uh, he'll catch up with the next one in February, I have a feeling. All right, so we're kind of catching up with ourselves. But that's the way it's set up. So we started at the beginning of the church year, not the beginning of the calendar year, which is the way the book is set up. So we're going to study Reverend Johan Conrad Johansson <coughs> Leia. Announcements. And I got one up here. All right. Somebody left me a flyer for the blood drive on. Monday the 20th of February from 3.30 to 7.30. Come on, come on. Pat. I'm going to Fairborn Fish this week. If anybody has any food donations or pantry donations, um, please have it with a brown box next to the elevator. Thank you. Up here or down there? Up here. Right here. Okay. Brown box outside the elevator here. Fish next week. This way. This way. Okay. See? Uh, we have uh, 118 pieces that need to be eaten, so if you're not doing anything at 5 o'clock this afternoon, we'll be having our uh, pizza supper, we'll have salad and some of the beverages. Uh, and then uh, we were, were set up with a trivia game after the uh, supper. So you're all welcome to come, bring your family and friends. So it's always good time. After uh, Bible class, I appreciate having some help to change the, the arrangement of the tables in here so we can uh, be ready for that. Okay, I don't see Brett here, but uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, immediately ahead of the pizza supper, I believe, is the town hall meeting for February. The voters meeting will be in two weeks, the week after the Super Bowl. And so the town hall is evening to come for 4 o'clock to stay for pizza and have fellowship and all of that. Any other announcements? Learn <laughs> once, learn twice, done. Catechism. A week ago I did the Seventh Commandment, so this week, before we dismiss the, uh, the uh, Sunday School, we must do the Eighth Commandment. Read it with me. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. This is the word of the Lord. All right, Sunday school kids, you're dismissed. And forever I will know this explanation as put the best instruction on it. Okay? Explain everything in the kindest way is kind of the same thing. But put the best instruction on it. Let's open with a brief word of prayer. Most glorious Trinity, in your mercy, we commit to you this day our bodies and souls, all our ways and goings, all our deeds and purposes. We pray you, so open our hearts and mouths that we may praise your name which is above all names, is holy. 
And since you have created us for the praise of your holy name, grant that our lives may be for your honor and that we may serve you in love and fear. For you alone, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And you'll note that this is a prayer that was written by Pastor Leah. It's in your, your book. Here's the gentleman right here. January 2nd is his Saint Day when we remember him. Okay? This is a photograph taken uh, in the, suppose I can find out, in the 1850s when photography was coming in. But that's not a, an engraving or a painting, that is a photograph of Johann Conrad Wilhelm Leia. Now, you'll notice that in German it's spelled this way. I'm using the anglicized version that I was taught at the seminary where it is L-O-E-H-E, -E, L -O -E -H -E, Leia. And that's how we say it at Fort Wayne, Leia. Okay? We're going to talk about his life and times, his legacy. We're going to talk about the ordination controversy of the 1840s. And we're going to deal with the rest of the story. And if you have your book with you, it's on pages 12 and 13 of Celebrating the Saints. So who was Pastor Leia? Pronounced Lay, L-A-Y, of. He was born on 21 February 1808 in the town of Firth in present-day Middle Franconia. Now, for those who don't recognize that, it's in Bavaria, in the southeast of Germany. He was the son of a shopkeeper, a uh, middle-class family, but not a noble family, because they didn't have the fun uh, in the middle of the name like others did. But his father died when he was only eight years old in 1816, and he was raised by his mother. Interesting, a parallel in Leah's life, his wife is going to die, we'll find out, at about that same age with their children, and he will raise the children. So his mother raised him and his sisters, and then Leah raised his three, four children, one of which passed, passed on very early. He received his basic education in the Latin school in Nuremberg. Now, it's also called, you look it up online, it was called a gymnasium. 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 Well, it's not about playing basketball, things like that. That was a Latin school for young boys and girls. And later, he was admitted to theological studies at the University of Carolina in 1826. He was heavily influenced by two reformed professors at that university, Christian Kraft and Thomas Van Kempen. Now, do note that this early part of the 19th century, I don't have it on my slides, but I thought I'd talk to it. His education and that of many, many, many students around the world was influenced by what is called rationalism. Can anybody tell me what rationalism is and was? Because it's still with us today. I want you guys. Rationalism. Your students. Help me out. Help me out. Nobody? Robin. If something could be like scientifically proven or shown to be physically possible, you need to be physically All right. If we're talking, yes, sir. Isn't it the belief that you can come to an understanding of truth simply by thinking through it and reasoning by your own mind, we can arrive at everything that we need to know, um, all the big truths? Okay. It followed out of the Enlightenment, okay, out of the Renaissance, and it was the, the dawn, you could say, of thinking that we can, as he said, know everything there is to know. We can figure it out. We can reason it by rational thinking. Now, if you contrast that with Scripture, the two are at odds. We have a conscience, yes. We have a reason, yes. But we cannot know our loving God from our conscience and our reason. We cannot see in the world our Lord Jesus Christ. 
and what his suffering and dying on the cross meant for us. That's available only on the basis of Scripture. So early on, Leah had to contend with reformed thinking and rational thinking. These two professors were not rationalists necessarily, but they were reformed. Now, reformed, that goes after the Calvinist blend of things, not the Lutheran blend of things. In Germany at this time, there were two primary churches. The Catholic Church was a shadow of itself then and, and even today. But the Calvinist Church and the Lutheran Church. But when you got to a thing called the Prussian Union, the leaders of the early, late 18th, actually the early 19th century, didn't want to have the bickering and the arguments that went between the Reformed Church and the Lutheran Church. They said, enough. You guys need to figure it out and get it together and we're going to have one church movement. And that was the, uh, 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 the, the landed church movement at that time. I'm not going to bother you with the, uh, the German name. I didn't put it on here. <laughs> but it was the, the, the thought that you could be a Reformed pastor in a Lutheran church or likewise a Lutheran pastor in a Reformed church and you had to compromise. You had to toe the line. So Leia had to you know, deal with that. Ultimately, when he went to Berlin after he left uh, the uh, church, uh, the University of Erlangen, he was introduced to the Lutheran Confessions, and he became a student of Luther under the teaching <coughs> of David Hollas there in Berlin. And then in 1828, he spent a whole term there in Berlin. And he attra was attracted not so much by the lectures <coughs> of the professors, as by the sermons of famous Lutheran preachers at that time. He graduated from Erlanger in London in 1830, but waited until 1831 before receiving a pastoral assignment, or being ordained at that time and receiving a pastoral assignment. Now, at that time, when, unlike we do today, when a pastor goes to seminary today, it's two years of education, one year of field work or vicarage, and a one year of studies. At that time, you did four years of studies, five years of vicariat, and, or vicariat, and uh, then and only then would you receive an assignment. So he went through all of that. The first was at then the uh, Kirken Lummets in Upper Franconia, again, in Bavaria, where he had come from. His fervent evangelical preaching attracted large congregations, by that meant large groups of people, and that puzzled the ecclesiastical authorities. What is this guy doing? He's only a young student. What's he got going for him? Well, preaching and teaching the word is what he had going for him, so that really what it was all about. He transferred for a series of parishes on that vicarage assignment before finally settling in Neuen Devils. Neuen Dettel Sau. You've got to get the S in there. Neuen Dettel Sau. You probably never heard of it, probably never will again. But it's a small town, I mean a village in Bavaria. He had applied for at least a half a dozen assignments around large urban churches in Germany, including the ones that he had vicared at, only to be turned down because they said, oh, he's too confessional. He's too Lutheran. No, we don't want him. So finally he settled on, well, I'll go back home. And they said, oh, good. We'll send him back to the woods, the sticks, the hinterland of the church, to a small town, and no one will ever hear of him again. That was so ironic. Because his name in Lutheran circles is known around the world, even though he had to spend 38 years of ministry and Neuen Devil South, about 19 miles from where he was born. He tried but never was able to get that assignment, even after that, to an urban setting. In 1837, he married Helen Andrea. In their six years of marriage, they had three sons and one daughter. But like his father, like I said, before him, his wife died in 1843 after a brief illness. And he commented at that time, that he could not wait to join her 
in the heavenly communion of saints on the last day. And you'll see that communion of saints emphasis come back over and over again in his teaching. By most accounts, he was an ideal pastor who interacted well with a variety of different classes of people. He was a good teacher. He was certainly a good preacher. And he focused his theological studies on the Lutheran confessions and put considerable thought into the celebration of Holy Communion as the center of congregational life. Here at Bethlehem, beginning in February of 2002, we followed that example when we adopted the every Sunday, every service, every divine service, I got a copy of that, celebrating the Lord's Supper. We very seldom use an ordinary service, matins or vespers, other than on evening services or special occasions where we would not have uh, communion necessarily. But he focused on Holy Communion as a center of congregational life. He was especially interested in old Lutheran liturgies. So he searched through the libraries and came up all the way back to Luther, the German Mass, and so forth. And uh, he used that as resources for him to reform. And our hymnal today, even the Lutheran service book, has traces of his initiatives his teaching, his thinking about the service built within. Despite being confined to a pastor in an out-of-the-way village, which he never left, they went and get rid of him and they put him out there in the woods, he never left. Leia nevertheless exhibited a keen interest in missionary work. Not in Germany, but around the world. He was particularly interested about the condition of recent German immigrants to North America. And we are part of that legacy, as we'll see, of what Leia did to help us here in North America. He wanted to raise funds by soliciting donations from a variety of sources to help bolster the spiritual state of the immigrant population beginning in 1841. Mind you, they were leaving the land church in Germany, which was reformed by and large coming to America because they did not want to be reformed. They wanted to be Lutheran. But they didn't bring the pastors with them that they really needed. So you had colonies that were established in Missouri, Perry County, Missouri. You had colonies established up in uh, Michigan, and the Mother Church, Frankenmuth, Michigan, is one of the churches that his people, his pastors that he supplied, helped found. Even in Ohio, where we did our planning for the uh, 2020 LW Mail District Convention, St. John's Lutheran Church, in, uh, outside of Wapa, Connecticut, that is a church founded by one of Leah's men who came to America. And in the narthex, they have Leah's picture and they have the first pastor that uh, he sent to uh, support that. And there's a, uh, I couldn't find exactly the, 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 the uh, traces of it. There's what's called a uh, heritage trail in Ohio and eastern Indiana of the remnants of what Leah and his men did. So he raised a lot of money to help North American missions. In 1843, he responded to Winnikin's letter, the distress of the German Lutherans in North America, and I'm not going to give you the German, it's just long. I mean, oh my goodness. But that's what it says in English. And Reverend Johann Friedrich Rucker determined to reply with action. So Pastor Rucker and Pastor Leah, they took action to satisfy this need from Pastor Winnegan. They established the church news about and from North America. Kind of like a Lutheran witness in Germany, but it's all about North America in order to raise support on behalf of the needs of German Lutheran immigrants to North America. Leah also encouraged the sending of pastors to North America to assist the settlers and help with conversion of Native American populations. So I don't know there is much of a remnant in Michigan, but he concentrated in Michigan and out west and sending men 
that would help bring the native tribes into the church, provide translation of their languages into uh, the, the Bible, into their languages, and missionaries to Native Americans. To this end, and this is the interesting part for me, personally, he financed two schools to train missionaries here. For years he trained them in Germany and sent them on uh, a passage to North America, but then he decided, why pay that extra expense? Why not recruit men here and train them here, and then they'd be sent out here in the United States? One of which became Wartburg College in Waverly, Iowa, and the other which is now Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Very interesting. In 1846, a pastor in Fort Wayne educated two young men. But once the Missouri Synod was established a year later, then they established those two men and that one pastor as the founder of Concordia Theological Seminary, what he called a practical seminary. Now, I'm a graduate of the practical seminary. I guess that makes the other one the unpractical seminary. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go there. You know, I'd get in trouble with Pastor Casey if I took that on, because he's a St. Louis graduate. No matter. I think the, the faculties of both seminaries are equally capable and turn out equally capable pastors today and they have for many, many years. But I'm from the practical seminary. In 1876, <coughs> Springfield was where they moved the seminary. And then later it was moved to St. Louis. Actually, it was on the campus of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. And they existed side by side, but then finally went back to Springfield, Illinois, and there it stayed until 1976, when the Missouri Synod, after the Seminex breakup and everything in 1876, the convention of the Missouri Synod decided to close what was the senior college at Fort Wayne and bring Concordia Theological Seminary back home to Fort Wayne, where it is even today. Now, I had the, the, the uh, honor of studying at both places, Springfield and Fort Wayne. It took 30 years to do that, but I, that's what I got to do. So I studied at both locations for that. Uh, and if you go to uh, Fort Wayne, I'll show you the, the, the map and, and the picture in a little bit. Uh, and there, are, there are traces of the Springfield Seminary there at Fort Wayne. You come in, and the first thing you see on your left is a statue. Remember where that statue is for those who have been there? Uh, it's Martin Luther. It's Martin Luther. Interesting, reading about the statue, the artist used the hand molds of Martin Luther himself when he died. They took a, a, a face cast and hand cast. So the, the face of the younger Luther, but the hands of the statue are actually molded in Martin Luther's hands. So that's very interesting there. And uh, the lines of the statue all come up to what Luther is holding. What's he holding? He's holding the Bible, the Holy Script. And we'd like to say, contrary to what the statue at St. Louis is to the Fort Wayne statue, the Fort Wayne statue has an open Bible. St. Louis has a cloak. I'm not going to <laughs> I don't know. But it does have an open Bible for the world to see. Now, that statue was commissioned in the uh, 60s at Springfield and then was moved to Fort Wayne, and it's there uh, at the time. There's a bell outside of Kramer Chapel. It's called the Student Bell. And uh, it was in the chapel at uh, Springfield. And uh, when they were getting ready to move and everything, so they, they were rounding up all the pieces and parts, and somebody said, don't forget the bell in the, the upper story of the first classroom building there. And they said, oh, there's a bell up there? Oh, yeah. Very nice barn bell. So they went up and they got it and bought it. But they, they couldn't put it in the bell tower, what was called the bell tower, at Kramer Chapel. It was too big, and that, that wasn't the structure was built for a big bronze bell. So they made a bronze framework behind the chapel. So the tradition is every man who graduates from 
and I guess it goes for the deaconesses as well, who graduate from Fort Wayne, they get to ring the bell. Well, the last day of the last class I finished in November of 2003, I got to ring the bell. Not once, I rang it 31 times. <laughs> <laughs> A couple guys went by and England, what are you doing? I'm ringing it for every year it took me to get my program done. So I'm a man of Leah in many ways because I came through that tradition and I follow in his tradition uh, up to a point here. Individuals sent by Leah were instrumental in the founding of the Evangelical Joint Senate of Ohio, which is focused mainly in Columbus. Capital University and the Trinity Theological Seminary in uh, Columbus are part of that original Evangelical. Junkle Lutheran Joint Center of Ohio. So Leah withdrew his support from that center in 1805, 1845, over some doctrinal differences, which we'll talk about in a moment here. His emissaries were among the founders of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Center in 1847, when the church body met in Chicago to establish what was then the Evangelical Lutheran Center, I forgot the Lutheran part in there, um, Missouri, Ohio, and other states, later the Lutheran Church of Missouri Senate, over half of the pastors were Leah men. Very interesting. Very interesting. Now, while he is most remembered for his encouragement of missionary activity in the United States, he also supported work in Brazil, the Ukraine, Australia, New Guinea, and other places around the world. Literally, as I say later on, on five continents of this globe, he sent missionaries to do the Lord's work through his foreign missionary society. Individuals sent by Royal were instrumental in founding of that Evangelical Lutheran Center of Ohio, and then uh, he's most remembered for his encouragement of missionary work. I got this slide twice. Anyway, he endured strained relations with the regional authorities over circulating or articulating a clear confessional status for the church during a period from 1848 till 1852. At one point, he even considered leaving the church, that is, the church in Germany, though ultimately he was able to resolve differences between him and the church leadership. He never left the land church in Germany. In 1853, Leia supporters established the Evangelical Lutheran Center of Iowa, and they did work out west then. So you see what he was doing? Now mind you, he never left Germany. He never left Bavaria other than go to Berlin. One time. He never saw the Atlantic Ocean, the North American continent, South America, Australia, nothing. Other than in his mind's eye and in the voices of people who needed spiritual advisors, counselors, pastors, teachers, wherever they were around the world. One man had that vision, and that was Wilhelm Leia. Although he never saw the ocean, like I just said, never left Germany, it would impact the Lutheran Church's efforts on the five continents. And I gave you all those continents. All right. In addition to being concerned about foreign matters, he retained a concern for domestic social matters. And here in Bavaria at that time, he saw a great need for young women and unmarried girls. Out in the countryside, a farmer would have a large family. Well, the boys would work the farm, and the girls, well, they had to go find a husband somewhere, or they were just going to be unmarried. Spencers, whatever. So there was a, a real need because education was not focused on the women at that time. The cloister system of the Roman Catholic Church was long, long gone by the Counter-Reformation period. So that was not part of what the Catholic Church was doing. So in rural society, underprivileged uh, women had very, very little things to give them an education. And in, in this spirit, 
He uh, established the first deaconess mother house in 1849. Now, I'm going to ask you, what's a deaconess? I think we've only seen one or two deaconesses in this church in my 37 years here in this church that have come and visited us. Do you know what a deaconess is? They're not Lutheran nuns. No, 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 don't do that one. They're not Lutheran nuns. The majority are young women. Robin? I'd say Paul's in Cincinnati where Mike and I used to attend. Um, we had a deaconess and she focused a lot on evangelical tech work in the community. She was a member of the staff there. She did okay. missions outreach to the local community. All right. They can either be assigned to a local congregation and assist the pastor in uh, social work and in uh, mercy work. They can be assigned to an orphanage, a nursing home, a hospital, a variety of different missions. They wear a uniform, like, like pastors wear a uniform, okay? They wear normally a blue uniform with a, a patch on their sleeve. I think the gold is for deaconess in training, and the silver is for graduate deaconess or vice versa. I can never get this right. The, the gold is for graduate. graduate, all right. Opposite to the military. Military silver is more important than gold. But that's what deaconesses are. So even today, what started at Valparaiso University almost 100 years ago, and I don't believe it's there any longer. I don't believe Valpo has that. But at River Forest, at Miquan, at Ann Arbor, I believe, and at some, uh, the uh, seminary in St. Louis, and I know the seminary in Fort Wayne, we have deaconess programs. Now, it's at uh, uh, River Forest, I believe, is an undergraduate program. You can get trained as a deaconess. At the seminaries, it's a graduate program. And you'll go to classes, and you'll have two or three women in the class taking doctoral classes, taking Greek, you know, exegetical classes. They take most everything that you would as a pastor take. And um, counseling and other things, Lutheran worship they take. Not that they preach, okay? They don't preach, they don't become lives. But they're given all of the training, basic training that a pastor gets. And that's what the deaconess program is. So 150 years later, the Lutheran deaconess program is still going. It's very strong today. So you'll see deaconesses around. I don't, does anyone know if there's a deaconess here in the Miami Valley? Any of our churches have none? I would say down in Cincinnati. Um, okay, that, well, that's a different zone. Okay. Different zone, but down in probably in the area, but I know uh, at my home church in Florida right. had a business. Uh, her, main mission, her, main, her main mission was to help take care of the um, nursing. Well, in Florida. The sick, I mean, and the sick and the shut-in. Yeah, and that's what they do. Now, they do not do pastoral duties. They will not take communion out to uh, members. They don't do that. That's uniquely a pastoral function. Well, but they're doing not. devotions, doing, you know, uh, spiritual care ministry. They do that. And they augment the uh, men of the pastoral ministry. So that's what deaconesses do. So we have that starting in 1849. Now, I read this morning, eight years before this, and it wasn't Leah's real idea, but he was the most successful. Eight years before this, another pastor in Germany started a mission, but it failed. So he says, all right, I see what he did, and he, what he did wrong, and I'm gonna do it differently, and he was successful. Even today, in Wayne Dettelsmile, that location, is a center of social work in the church there in Germany, in that area of Bavaria. Even today, it still exists. The house became a place of social and educational activity, hosting schools, hospitals, and other social agencies. Now, this is what history tells us. The deaconesses lived in celibacy and in a spiritual economic community. So that's where you get the, 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 the uh, the uh, cloistered uh, Lutheran nuns. No, 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 no. 
you can be a deaconess today and either come in married or many of them meet a young uh, man at the seminary and get married and they go out on a joint call assignment because deaconesses are called. Sue? We had a deaconess, trained deaconess here who was not to marry the military and so she kept her name on the list because she was not working. Okay, so she wasn't active. But, yeah. Okay. What, what, what time was that? Um, it's a, a minute. A minute. That sounds familiar. I didn't realize or remember that she was a deaconess. Okay. All right. So at least we've had one that came to. Uh, Mark and Melissa and then. Okay. So they do serve. And they do serve normally in larger congregations and areas. They don't have to live in celibacy today. So Newhouse has circled the mother house with its schools, an institution for the mentally handicapped, a prayer chapel, a workshop, a men's hospital, a women's hospital, and so forth. It just grew, like spokes of a wheel grew out around the mother house there. The work in Northern Dental South suddenly grew larger. On our account of their solid and well-rounded education, the deaconesses were everywhere appreciated. Wherever they went, they were seen and appreciated. And Layup could not begin to fulfill all the requests for deaconesses from congregations and medical, especially the medical facilities at that time, because they were trained in the medical arts as nurses, basically, at his deaconess house. And the deaconess programs in the LCMS are roughly patterned after Leah's work, although, like I said, celibacy is not required or practiced today. His legacy. So living in Northern Nor Nor Devil South for 38 years and doing all this missionary work, what really did he leave behind? He died on 2 January in 1872, so the 2 January is his same day at the age of 63. He had suffered a stroke about uh, five or six years earlier, and on that day in 1872, he suffered a final stroke and passed uh, at the age of 63. He had influenced the life of the Lutheran Church on five continents, and the chapel at Wordward Theological Seminary in Dubuque, Iowa, is named for him. Likewise, one of our two classroom buildings at Fort Wayne is named for him. We have Winnicott Hall, and we have Leia Hall. Leia is the bigger one of uh, the two. So if you've been there and you've been to the bookstore, everybody goes to, to Fort Wayne goes to the bookstore, right? Mm -hmm. Great place. So where the food bank is located is behind that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's Leia Hall. All right. He had significant influence on missions, confessionalism, and liturgic as it relates to Lutheran. An individual sent by Leah were instrumental in founding the Evangelical Lutheran Joint Center in Ohio, though he withdrew, as I said before, his support in 1845. His emissaries remain the founders, basically, of the Missouri Synod, and he still has that legacy going on. While he's most well remembered for his encouragement of missionary activity, he also supported work throughout the world. And I added Ukraine just yesterday. I didn't realize that the Lutheran Church in Ukraine, which is small, but nevertheless it's there, is part of his work. Now, this is an interesting part. It's not in your, your student guide um, or in the textbook. He's also remembered for his devotion to the divine service. And uh, the fingerprints of what he was doing and bringing back and reforming the divine service after the rationalists had gotten hold of it and diluted it, much like the Catholics had done beforehand, <coughs> is still there. And he and this, and this, this is basically out of his words, he understood the divine service as the place where the heavenly bridegroom meets his bride. <coughs> it's also where the thoughts behind this is the feast, the feast of victory for our God, that canticle kind of follows Leah's thinking as well. For Leah, the center of the church was the <coughs> liturgy of word and sacrament. And from this lively and life-giving center, every aspect of the church's life radiated. 
you go up the stairwell up here, and it has Bethlehem in the middle, and it has preach the word, administer the sacraments. That's what we're all about. If we fail as a church, if we fail as pastors to do that wrong or not do it, not preach the word in its truth and purity and not administer the sacrament of the altar in a regular basis, the church is dead. It's going to die if it hasn't already. And too many churches around the country, even Lutheran churches, have lost the beat. They've lost that focus. And hence, they're beginning to die. They're dying out, and they're withering, and they're passing away. Now, I don't mean farm churches in the middle of Iowa that were, in years past, you had one kind of like on every section corner. You know how big a section of farmland is? A mile square. Okay? We look at Iowa from a satellite map, a big grid down there, section grid. Mile square. And the farmhouses and the churches tend to be where those intersect. So even today, there are fewer and fewer farmers and there are fewer and fewer churches simply because farm families have moved away. Well, that's one thing. But for a church in a, found, uh, in a location like Bethlehem to lose its focus on mission work and outreach, that is, that is faith, fail. That's fail. All right, so this word sacrament is really where it's all about. Now, this is his legacy. This is my legacy in a sense. All right, let me give you a, a quick tour. As you come in, this is the Luther statue here. These are, are what were dormitory buildings, okay? Same back here and over here, okay? The dormitory buildings were built like chalets. They had a basement floor, a middle floor, and a top floor. Back here is the Quinstead. They were all were named for Lutheran reformers, Lutheran uh, men. The Quinstead, the Q dorm. That's where I stayed for six months in uh, 2003. Being, even though I was married and had a family, they weren't there with me, so I had to live on campus and I had to live in the dorm. Well, after being out of college for 19 years, yeah, that was a real experience. But I would say this, even though I was away from my family for six months, I enjoyed it. The, the collegiality of being with young men and older men who were studying for the ministry, that was really special. But you know what was even more special? Is this building right here, which is what? That's the chapel. Ero, a Eero Serenin, who designed this campus here from Sweden, I believe, when he spoke to why that design, the lake was already there on the farm, okay? The Kramer Farm, hog farm, it was a hog farm, uh, was who gave the property to the Missouri City to build the senior college as it was back in the 50s. The lake was there. And he wanted the chapel to be the center of everything. And it is. The whole life, the educational life, the worship life of the school is focused on the chapel. Every morning at uh, 10 o'clock, the chapel bell rings, classes are, are getting out, and everybody goes, by and large, everybody goes to chapel. Not everybody, but most people. And it is a really wonderful experience. If you've not been to the chapel at Fort Wayne on a regular weekday morning and heard five or six hundred male voices, predominantly male voices, singing so fervently like we sang by strong word this morning, you will shake the building, literally. It is, the, the, the acoustics are so marvelous because it's concrete, slabs, and brick walls, and the sound just, it builds on itself. He couldn't have designed it better, I don't think. But anyway, over here is the Luther Hall where the cafeteria is. Here's the gymnasium back here. Here's Winnegan Hall, and here's Leah Hall. So the two Winnegan 
who was there in Fort Wayne, and Leah, who was overseas, <coughs> are remembered there at uh, uh, Fort Wayne. And uh, this is a, a really marvelous place. Also down here in front, the uh, library was this part right here, but in, uh, from about 2005 to 2015, there was a capital campaign that expanded the library, and it's marvelous. If you ever go there, don't miss going into the library. They accomplished with that expansion one thing. In years past, all of the uh, precious uh, manuscripts, old manuscripts, were all kept in the attic in Leia Hall. And if you get hold of one, you had to put a slip in to the library, and then they would go across campus once a day and go up into the attic and go find it and bring it back down, and the next morning you could go check it out to be read right there in the library. You couldn't check out their original documents, but you could see them. You could actually handle them and read through them. Most of them, however, were in German, so it's like, okay, for an English guy, no, uh-uh, but I can read some. Anyway, when they expanded the library, they brought all the manuscripts back, and they're in the library there. And it's mar marvelous because you can study and be seeing <coughs> the lake out front there. So it's a marvelous campus. Sarina did a great thing. And I had one, one experience. Being in a Q dorm right back here, you see the track that's right behind here? They have races and things. They do soccer over here. You see the soccer goals. One day we had in uh, October of 2003, we had a tremendous thunderstorm. I mean, in the morning, it was a Saturday morning, it was crashing and lightning and raining like frogs. And then all of a sudden it quit. And then he was here moving up. And somebody came into the queue dorm right back here and says, hey, there's a rainbow outside. Okay, I like rainbows. So we all run out the end of the queue dorm. And over here is the end of a rainbow. I want to go. Well, it wasn't there because we went over there. It wasn't there. <laughs> but you can see the trees back here along the St. Joseph River. The rainbow was in front of the trees and in the, the field out there. I've never seen the end of a rainbow before. They're always somewhere away. But I saw the end of a rainbow and I thought, at the end of my six months of study, really exhausting study, because I did in two quarters about two years worth of work to catch up because I they only gave me partial credit for what I had done back in the 70s so I had to catch up and finish everything else but to see the end of the rainbow was a for me an affirmation that the Lord is with me his blessings are going to be with me and I can soldier on to the to the very end the administration building where the president Dr. Rast has his office is right here so this is the main thoroughfare, and that's the main thoroughfare, and I can tell you a whole lot of stories about this. But this is Leah's legacy in brick and stone, because he sent men originally to the United States, and then he established schools to train men here at the United States, in the United States. Now, the one thing he is known about, and probably sours a little bit of his reputation his legacy is what's called, I, I'm calling the ordination controversy. Okay? I have to ask you, what is ordination to start with? Making a pastor or a pastor. Making a pastor or a pastor. All right, making a pastor or a pastor. Well, church body recognizes the to be a preacher. Okay. All right. There are two aspects for a pastor, a pastoral candidate, to be become a pastor. One is you have to be ordained, yes, and Pastor Casey, Pastor Reddy, and I, and all other pastors are ordained. And unless you resign your your pastoral ministry and leave the roster, you will forever be ordained. But what's the other dimension of it? Called. Now, if you think back, when we say the words of absolution, upon this year confession, I, by virtue of my office, 
as a called and ordained servant of Christ. Which comes first? The call. Then, then ordination. Leah wanted it the other way around. He had very much a, a Catholic understanding, a higher churchly understanding, that it was ordination that made all the difference. All ordination is, is a recognition that the church has deemed the candidate to be qualified to preach and teach and to serve in the church. And the reason they recognize you as an individual is because you have a call. So in 2002, May, the Voters Assembly of Bethlehem Lutheran Church issued a call for me. Now it was to come back to Bethlehem as an interim, you know, measure at that time, so that I could be here and be in place should we have the uh, option for a mission congregation somewhere in this area. Remember War of Life? Remember War of Life down in Beaver Creek? Yeah. Five congregations in our circuit banded together, not only financially, but also in terms of members, seated that congregation in Beaver Creek. They were in together for a year or two. They were able to call their first full-time pastor. He didn't work out. He did not work out. He took the church in a, in a totally different direction. He destroyed the communion of saints, in essence, by fracturing the church at that time. It was a, a, a popular uh, uh, notion that what was called house churches. He kind of built on the New Testament idea that people would meet at Lydia's house or Apollo's house or whatever because they didn't have a building or a place to come together. They were thrown out of synagogues. They were not in, allowed in the temple in Jerusalem when it still existed. But house churches today, no. We have a communion of saints, a body of believers here at Bethlehem. So Leah had problems with that. Toward the end of his life, that unfortunate rift developed between Leah and C.F.W. Walter, who was the first president of the Missouri Synod. And it was over that understanding of church and ministry. Leah believed that the pastoral office existed independently of a congregational call as a direct appointment from Jesus Christ through ordination. Now, there's an aspect of ordination when a pastor is ordained, any pastors who are there, and the ordaining official, there has to be at least one ordaining official, who is also called an ordained servant, uh, lay hands. And that is apostolic in symbolism. But we do not have an apostolic succession, like uh, the Catholic Church makes believe, in a sense, that they have un unbroken line all the way through to uh, the end of time. No. The pastoral office does not exist independently of the congregation and the call of the congregation. So Walter held that a pastor could only be ordained after he received that divine call. So May of 2002, right before I went to school, that call was out there. And I remember the day Dr. Paketcher came to me and said, Ed, we have this no, it was 2003, I'm sorry, I'm one off by a year. We have this call, a by name call for you from Bethlehem in Ohio. Where, where, are you willing to take that call or do, should we look for another? And I said, well, I kind of prefer that for the time being. I gave them the reasons. And he went, okay, we understand. But the, the district presidents had to all get together and decide that it was right for me to be coming back here which I've been here in Bethlehem, 14 years active, and now six years going on inactive since I retired in 2017. But I had to be called, then I could be ordained. After much discussion, Luther and Walter's position came to dominate the American Lutheran teaching. There must be a call before a candidate can be ordained and installed. And this was for many, many years. Some would say that such ideas still remain in the church today. 
and some would even accuse some uh, individuals at Fort Wayne of still holding this position. I am not at all sure that that is even was even true or is even true today. The 12 is still the operative, you know, idea. The absolution of divine service reads, as I said, as a called and ordained servant of Christ. I might not have a call at this time, which I don't. I asked for release from my call in April of 2017, and Bethlehem gave me a peace for release from my call. So I am not called at this time. But I was called, and because of that call, I was ordained. And I am still ordained today. But it goes back to my call, which led to my ordination, which leads to why I can still serve and administer the sacraments and all of that. Do you all understand that, or any questions on that? It can be a hard concept at times. Everybody got it? Okay, called and ordained, in that order. Finally, the two parties agreed to disagree, but that basically ended Leah's work with the Lutheran Church in Missouri Synod. The rest of the story, I always like to give you the rest of the story, okay? Like Paul Harvey thing. There is much to be learned from Pastor Leah. For him, doctrinal indifference meant the death of Christianity. Doctrinal indifference meant the death of Christianity. Tempting as it might be to downplay doctrinal distinctions on a mission field, Leah knew that such an approach was a dead end. And he always maintained you've got to be faithful to Scripture. So doctrinal disunity destroys the basis for genuine mission. And pure doctrine and energetic mission must go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. You betray who you are and you lose the mission itself. C.F.W. Walter complimented Leah. Quote, next to God, it is Pastor Leah to whom our synod is indebted for its happy beginning and rapid growth in which it rejoices. It may well honor him as its spiritual father. It would fill the pages of an entire book to recount every, even briefly what for many years this man, with tireless zeal in the noblest unselfish spirit, has done for our Lutheran Church and our Synod in particular. Christian Weber, Lutheran, uh, uh, German Lutheran scholar on Leah, says, quote, It is no wonder, with all of his accomplishments, that without Leah and his co-workers, the number of Lutherans in the world today might be cut in half. He had a heart for mission shaped by his love for the Church and a longing for that heavenly city populated by people from every tribe and tongue, unquote. I was a guy from this Podunk village in Bavaria, accomplished what he did except by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. Absolutely amazing. I'm so honored that Pastor Whitty selected this one for me to talk to because I am a lay of man in the sense of my roots go back through the seminary to this and the appreciation of word and sacrament, which is so much a part of you know, my heritage and yours. I wanted to leave you with this. CPH, and you can look it up on your, uh, uh, their website. This is the latest, and I think from what I was reading, one of the best biographies in, in English, okay, of uh, Wilhelm Leah. 1808 to 1872. And it calls, it says it's the latest and best biography of a father of confessional Lutheranism in North America. And I think the copyright is like 2015 or something like that, so it's relatively late. There was another uh, English one being written, and I got some information from that. But if you want to, you can go back in addition to your textbook. You can go back and uh, Google, you know what Google is, right? The, the, the seminary students, uh, university students' favorite resource, although there are others out there. <laughs> so Leah is there, and the, the uh, Wikipedia article is rather good. Rather good. I don't know who wrote it, but it's rather good. Here's what I like. You'll find a lot of things out there. One thing I wanted to leave with, with you, uh, in the Lutheran Service book, there is a hymn 
my Wilhelm Lea, hymn number 536. Uh, and it's called, One Thing's Needful, Lord, This Treasure. Teach me highly to regard. All else, though it first give pleasure, is a yoke that presses hard. Beneath it, the heart is still fretting. And you, you can get the, 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 uh, the pattern here. Beneath it, the heart is still fretting and striving. Da, 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 da. All right. You've heard of the tune before. No true lasting happiness, happiness ever provided. This one thing is needful. All elders are vain. I count all but loss that I, Christ, may obtain. Amen. 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 Well, it was my pleasure to share with you a great saint of the church. And keep in mind, when we say saint, we mean uh, a holy person of God that the Lord used for his purpose in ministry and in service in our life and society. I mentioned at the opening of uh, uh, the service that the opening hymn, which is part of the opening part of the closing, Thy Strong Word, uh, by uh, Martin Franzman, if I were to nominate a great saint of the church, there are two I have in mind, if I had to say it. Uh, William Beck, who translated the entire Bible into English from Hebrew and Greek, and Martin Franzman. Now, Martin Franzman was unique in that he was a seminary professor who was not a pastor. He was never a seminary graduate. He's a classical scholar in Lutheran theology, but not a pastor. Whenever we saw him on campus, he had a shirt and tie. He didn't, he didn't uh, have the, uh, the office of pastor of work. But a great scholar, um, if you um, have seen the book in our library, The Word of the Lord Grows, and now you also buy strong word. That is a powerful hymn, and we'll sing it again at the opening and closing of our service there. Any other things? Well, thank you for listening. I don't think I lost anybody tonight. And I apologize if it, if it seemed like that we were in a hurry uh, finishing my slide presentation, because I, I got the word on Thursday morning, about halfway through the morning, that I was going to be up today. I'm like, uh, uh. I was on track for a week from now. So what you're hearing today is what I was going to do a week from now, both in, you know, in Bible class and in preaching. So it's good, but it, it's not as good as I, I could have made it. But then again, it, it's, I had a little, at least a little bit of time. So thanks to Pastor Casey that uh, I got a forewarning that uh, he wanted to switch. And I suggested we switch uh, to allow him to recover from this. All right. Any questions? Comments? All right. He should be up next week. Or I'm in real, real, real trouble. <laughs> I don't have another saint, number one. Yeah, I can get one, I'm sure. And I don't have a sermon for next week. I just All right. Let us stand. Go. church, to send missionaries around the world to spread the good news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. On his work, we stand today, and we thank you for the gift of this wonderful saint to our church today, and we remember him for his accomplishments on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.